Welcome to another edition of Future Artist Records Presents. I'm sitting down today with a singer-songwriter whose music has been described as soulful jazz blues and indie folk. Future Artist Records Presents, Zoe Berman. Zoe, thanks for coming down today. Yeah, thanks for I having appreciate me. appreciate it. Happy to be here. Good, good. So I'm going to start with this. You are not a native to Colorado. <laughs> no, I'm not. So, so what made you come to Colorado, and where are you from? So I'm originally from Simsbury, Connecticut, a um, little town in the northwest corner near Massachusetts. And um, I went to school in upstate New York in Saratoga Springs. Um, and then after, so in my senior year of college, I, I was just, I knew I wanted to move out here. I visited Colorado several times growing up. Um, just to go skiing and sort of explore the beautiful, the beautiful mountains. Yeah, <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of what drew me in, like uh, that of a lot of other people that have transplanted themselves out okay. here. And um, yeah, and so I just started applying for jobs and I went to school for psychology. Um, okay. So I applied for a lot of psychology lab positions and it worked out that I was able to move to Fort Collins um, and start a position at CSU. Oh, cool. And so I worked in that for a year and yeah. that been here ever since. And here you are. <laughs> and here I am. Um, you have, along with your psychology stuff, you have a classical background in piano. Uh, you're self-taught on guitar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you have a uh, tailor-made instrument we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, when you write, do you tend to write with one or, or the other of those in mind? And, and how does that approach differ from writing on, from piano to guitar? Sure. So I tend to to write my lyrics first, which okay. it's always you know the the age old question for songwriters: yeah, is yeah. it music or lyrics first? And <laughs> I actually do tend to typically write my lyrics first. And I've gotten in the habit over the last couple of years since moving to Colorado of of writing a lot on trails or on long drives. Um, and so the lyrics come to me when I'm not in front of an instrument, and then I kind of figure okay. out the chord structure and the embellishments a little bit later on. So okay. I don't always know whether it's going to be a piano or guitar song, but typically as I'm writing, it has a certain feel or it's inspired by a certain, you know, certain music that I'm listening to and inspired by, or it sort of varies, but if it, if when the lyrics are coming along, I sense sort of an Americana feel to it, um, that typically lends itself to a song on the guitar, and if it starts to feel like the structure of a soul or jazzier kind of song, then I'll typically write the chords on okay. the piano. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> Emotional abusers and 
victims let in their wake We take, take, we take We're not intention of repairing what you break Within and justifiably inflated Self-confidence What gives you the right to live your life at my expense So not again I'm generating my self-worth from within I step I should have taken many months ago No one should set this side so low But now I know they are Some satisfaction waiting on the universe To send a little bit of traction Just a tiny taste for now Doesn't have to be forever Just something that is better than this That I couldn't get the treatment I deserve Tallying up the times I've been shit out of luck Now my passivity, I'm gonna stand up for me No elusive trends, a little romance will do Does exist And when the bride of pain itself I seek Some satisfaction waiting on the universe To send a little bit of traction just to Doesn't have to be forever Just something that is better than this Crossed off of your list I'm not here to be your ego In a regularly be dismissed I've had it for now This is me signing out I'll emerge when I show That I'm gonna get the treatment I deserve When you talk about your writing process, you talked about being on the trails and stuff. Where do you draw your inspiration when you're doing that? And how do you approach your writing based on that? Because you, you mentioned sometimes it depends on what you're listening to. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're on the trail. So how, how does that work? Yeah, it just varies. Do, do, depends. Yeah, it depends on when that... inspiration sort of strikes. But yeah. I found in a lot of ways, I'm in, I mean, I'm often inspired by other musicians. Sure. Um, and then I'll, I'll sometimes, if I'm feeling a little bit stumped and I, and I want to force myself into exploring a new area or writing a new type of song, then I'll listen to an artist that, I, that I'm really inspired by and then I'll try to emulate that artist oh, okay. and, um, you know, not copying too much, but sure. just sort of write something that's, in, you know, listen to an album of theirs and then see what sort of comes in yeah. response to that. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'm just inspired by... You know, since moving out here, I've sometimes just been inspired by Colorado itself. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Or when I've been traveling, just some of the different places that I've been in. I have, um, and we'll we'll talk later, I'm sure, about um, my upcoming EP. But yes. there's yes. a song on the EP called "Edit, Delete, and Save," um, and that's one specific example of a of a tune I wrote on a trail um, in the Poudre Canyon, and it's a song about I was I was on this trail. Um, by myself, just solo hiking, and I was thinking about how the last time that I was there um, was with a guy that I was seeing, and I was all these memories were, yeah. you know, being conjured up just by being in that place again, and I was thinking about how that's kind of a bummer that <laughs> right, <but those laughs> that after that relationship ended, it was um, sort it sort of tainted that trail for me and, and it was just marked with all of these all of these memories of that person. So it's a song about reclaiming special places and making them your own after a, a breakup or whatever situation. Right, right. So sometimes yeah. it's really niche and specific like that and sometimes it's, you know, I've got songs that are 
just a, about you know the natural beauty around me that I'm looking at, gotcha. um, or I happen to be listening to music that inspires the right the right. Writing. So, did that song take care of the tainted? image of the trail? I think so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're good now? No, I just think about that song <laughs> if I go back to that area. <laughs> That's funny. It's it's amazing what can can trigger a, an idea. Yeah, absolutely. So. So that's that's it's cool to hear those stories because you know people go oh, I came up with this idea when I did whatever you know? yeah yeah so there's inspiration um, everywhere <laughs> yeah there absolutely is yeah how long does it take you to write a song once you have an idea and has your classical training influenced that process or does it is it all based on the idea well it again depends, depends. comes with the qualification so I think. I tend to write the first, you know, verse and chorus of a song all in one sitting whenever the idea strikes. And if I don't get right on it when the idea strikes, I typically lose it a right. little bit. I mean, I have all these strange, I keep a notepad by my bed and, you know, in whatever bag I have on me at all <laughs> times so I can write down these, jot down these little notes. But sometimes I go back and look at them and I don't even know what. <laughs> right. They're about so. Typically, if I if I write it down when the inspiration strikes, that's sort of the best method of you know condensing that thought process and putting it into something. Um, and I have a lot of abandoned songs that I've written half of, and then you know I lost that sort of that yeah. feeling that I felt in that moment, and yeah. so I um, haven't been able to finish them. But um, and hopefully I'll come back to them at some sure. point. Sure. Yeah. So sometimes I'll sit down and write an, an entire tune all in one sitting and. Um, or I'll write all of the lyrics and then I'll shape them um, when I sit down at whatever instrument I'm going to place it in. Um, and then the other part of your question in terms of the classical training, yeah. I don't know if it necessarily, I, I, I don't know if it's a conscious way that it's influenced my, my songwriting. I think sort of the progression of my training has influenced my songwriting. So I, I started out with classical piano. Um, and then I went for a, a brief little stint at a magnet school for classical piano. And I okay. didn't really love how stringent the culture of it was. It was very, I felt restricted. Um, and I wasn't being encouraged by my teachers there to explore composition or, you know, wasn't allowed to perform my own compositions right. when I said I was working on that sort of thing. So I ended up leaving that school. I just did that my freshman year of high school. And then I started taking jazz piano lessons okay. with a teacher from that school. Um, and he was a, a really huge influence for me. His name's Alex Nakamovsky, um, and he's an incredible jazz pianist. Um, and when I started taking lessons with him, he realized that I was also really into composition and writing my own songs um, and heard me sing and said, you know, you should be gigging. So he right. got me into, you know, he let me sit in on a few of his gigs and got me, you know, figuring out how to start booking my own gigs. Oh, very cool. Um, got me dabbling and recording. So that was a, I think that sort of entire path and how everything sort of yeah, just yeah. laid out. Do you think that um, his support of you doing that was more influential than your actual learning how to play? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I think, um, I mean, I, I think I'm somebody who has to write songs. Okay. I think some songwriters are just, um, it's just part of their nature and sort of how they yeah. Th thrive or survive and find, I, I mean, writing songs to me is a way of finding catharsis in, in a lot of different um, struggles that I face personally or, you know, stories that I hear just sort of working them out in my yeah. own brain. And, yeah. and so I think I sort of inevitably would have found that path and I've always been drawn to music. But I do think his encouragement and, you know, his sort of helping me harness some of those skills sure. definitely contributed. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever go back to a lyric you've written where you've had a concept for what you wanted it to sound like mm -hmm. and look at it and go, no idea what this was absolutely to <laughs> do you ever revisit More often a, than not. <laughs> and do you ever revisit a lyric and come up with a different idea from it than you originally had definitely so i keep notes on my phone of so sometimes i have like a so, my songwriting book with me but often i just have my phone and i you know jot things down yeah. and then i'll do a voice memo with what i have in mind okay. but i often don't label those right. <laughs> the organizational <laughs> part sort of falls to the wayside so then i end up with all of these sort of fragmented lyrics and then sometimes with accompanying melodies, 
But sometimes I'll just go back and revisit those lyrics and I'll think, oh, how could I work that into maybe this chord structure that right. I'm working on or this melody? And then it just, it's like a mixing and matching yeah. process. So it, yeah. yeah, it really varies. There's it, no really- You get lots of options. Yeah. Which is great. It's nice. <laughs> I like to just kind of, anytime there's an idea, however fleeting, just write it yeah. down, write yeah. everything down. So it- yeah. and the same <laughs> way he'll scrap his stuff it. all over the house with, you know, a line on it or exactly. two lines. Yeah. yeah. And like, um, hopefully it can be applied to something in the future. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Um, you described your sound as soulful jazz, blues, and indie folk. Why do you choose those descriptions? But then also, <laughs> who are your influences? So those descriptors, I think I struggle, as I think a lot of artists do, with, you know, labeling genres, sure. you know, a, assignments to what I'm working on because I don't think it necessarily, I think it's genre bending and it doesn't always fit into one right. sort of zone. Um, so those descriptors I think have come from others' words um, oh, okay. and the artists that other people compare me to most frequently right. and then sort of adopting whatever genre and, and, other, and you know the genres that they say they right. seem to think I identify with most. Right. Well, and, and Part, part of the reason I asked those together is because we had talked before the show about who some mm -hmm. of your influences are, and they're not. They're not related. Those descriptions. <laughs> yeah, uh, so, yeah. And so, you know, you do have to wonder sometimes how people come up with that, and I think you're right on the money. You know, you hear people say, well, you sound like this, mm -hmm. you, know, you fit in this genre, whatever, and then you yeah. start going, well, yeah, oh, maybe, right. maybe that's I'll the case. Yeah, I'll go with that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah. in terms of influences, to answer the other half of your question, I at a young age, I was really heavily influenced by Billy Joel. Mm -hmm. My dad is a huge Billy Joel fan. Uh, both of my f parents are big James Taylor fans. Okay. And my um, and my mom listened to a lot of um, like 70s soul and funk music. And cool. um, so like a lot of Earth, Wind & Fire, a lot of Stevie Wonder. And I still listen to all, both of those yeah. quite a bit. And um, so sort of a blend of, I think, I, w I don't know if my music sounds like a confluence of all of those right. artists, but I think I do draw bits and pieces from those early influences sure. in terms of, uh, you know, there's the singer-songwriter sort of acoustic troubadour sound yeah. as well as the, you know, the more R&B, soulful, funkier sound. I listen to a lot of funk music. Cool. Um, and I don't know if that translates in my own <laughs> music. I hope someday maybe right. I, I've been trying to force myself to, to write... Um, some more funk music, but uh, I think it, yeah, it, it's... Do you feel like you, as you write, even if you're trying to go into one direction, you kind of tend to shift yeah. to, to kind of a, a, a standard? Yeah, yeah. I, th I don't know about a standard, but I think there's a, an intrinsic sort of me-ness that right. comes out in all of my music, regardless of what I try, whatever exercise <laughs> right. I'm trying to, you know, experiment yeah. with. And so... I think even if I'm, I'll try to channel a certain artist and then it's like, well, this still just sounds like my, <laughs> right. my zone, so. Yeah. I, you know, I think all <laughs> musicians have a certain amount of that because. Got to put you, your stamp you, on it. Yeah, and well, and it's, it's coming it's, from it's, me, you, know, so. you are you, so. Yeah, I can't help go. that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that what, that's what makes your music sound the way it does. with you, baby, but that don't mean those memories can't be 
is a leery place I'm erasing you from those scenes I once knew and reclaiming them for me. Feet up to the tree line. I'm drinking in the mountain. Hey, this bluebird's kind of clouds inside. It's far more breath than wind. Ooh, and I hear what last hear. I let the sand distract me and relax me. Learning this a long time, like apple wine is a sweet treat. Scent of ponderous bark. You can temporarily knock the sweetness out on me, but I can't go do this in honey. I'll lend you a little time, but I'm taking back what's mine. All of the things that you took from me. I took a leap of faith and shared my favorite spaces with you, babe. If I don't mean those memories. Is a leery place I'm erasing you from those scenes I once knew and reclaiming them for me. I'm sure that's good in you If I dig down deeper in my mind And days are through And I ain't losing no more sleep No, losing no more sleep You can temporarily Knock the sweetness out on me But I keep producing honey I let you a little time But I'm taking back what's mine All of the things that Share my favorite spaces with you, babe. But that don't mean those memories can't be easily replaced. I'm erasing you from those scenes I once knew and reclaiming them for me. Let it delete You, we talked about this just a couple minutes ago. Um, we were talking about touring, mm -hmm. and you've done some mini tours. What, what have you learned on those mini tours, and, and what are some of the things you've experienced on those? Has that changed the way you write? Has it changed the way you've seen the music scene? I've sort of dabbled in some smaller mini tours um, in the past couple of years, and then this past summer, or I should really say this past year, I worked on booking a, you know, a longer tour, a month-long tour, mm -hmm. and I was on the road for 35 days. Um, so the, I learned a lot about just what went into the booking process for that, um, connecting right. with songwriters in other areas whom I've never met, um, and getting a sense of their music and what would fit well in a bill. Right. Um, and then on the actual tour, I definitely learned a lot um, just about the process of touring and what goes into it, the lack of glamour in right. it, you know, and just <laughs> figuring out where you're gonna lay your head that night. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a really, really positive learning experience. And, um, and it was really cool collaborating with songwriters in other areas and making those connections and making the, the sort of DIY uh, sort of music scene at least in the western side of the country, right. feel a little smaller. I'm already noticing all these connections where, you know, friends of every, everybody yes. seems to be connected and know each other and yeah. is doing sort of the same house concert circuit or the same whatever. And so that's been really cool. And I've already made new connections from that. Um, just, for, you know, whenever uh, either those folks that I played with are touring through Colorado or if they have friends or friends of friends who are touring right. through this area who have reached out to me and have made new connections. But, um, yeah, I think... 
The main takeaway uh, from that first, you know, sort of longer tour was that preparation is key and that you get out of it what you put into it. Okay. And I think had I done more, you know, put, and, and that goes um, not only in terms of effort, but also financially, I think if I'd done more targeted marketing or, you know, sort of more, more promotional efforts yeah. um, to, to get more people involved, get more people out and access those new markets um, where I was a complete newcomer. Right. Maybe that would have changed it. So I, I think it's sort of changed how I'll approach it in the future. Next time I, you know, take on an endeavor like that. What, was it all things that you had never considered before or that you considered and it just wasn't what you expected or it was what you were expected and you just weren't prepared or well, how do how do all those because <laughs> yeah because and, and did it affect your artistic side like you're like oh, I really like to be writing right now but I got to be on the phone you know yeah, booking shows I wouldn't say that I did I mean I've had the luxury of I've, I've been able to do music full-time over the past year and so I had the time to pour into it to do all that booking um where I fell short was with the marketing efforts, right. and I think that I was under operating under the assumption that if I booked bills with, you know, other songwriters who were based in those markets, that they would bring in the crowds, they would bring in the people. Gotcha. And yeah. that was a naive assumption. Um, and I think going into it, I would first of all, I would love to just do it the next, you know, the next tour. I'd love to just do a full all house concert. You okay. know, kind of circuit. Because yeah. I find with those types of shows, you really make those genuine connections with new people, l lasting connections. They, right. you know, the enduring connections where they want to follow your sort of musical journey. And the usually the hosts of those house concerts do bring people in. Whereas right. artists, you know, we're all struggling with the same thing. Where one, a lot of our network, a lot of our friends, are other artists. So they're yes. out playing their own gigs or you know, busy with their own creative pursuits. Yeah. Um, and so not. I, I I would do that differently. Um, I would still book bills with other artists, and it was great sure. to meet them, but I would do something differently to ensure that there were other people coming out and right. interacting with the music. Has your fan base grown the way you thought it would? From that tour? Yeah. I, I have a lot. <laughs> I have a lot of, of those folks that I met and interacted with on my email list, and you yeah. know they get my newsletters, and I hope will interact again down the line. Right. But I think that there has to be a certain amount of follow-up as well, um, returning to those right. places time and time again and in order to even discern whether or not they're gotcha. quote, fans yeah. or right, in, right. at least enduring fans. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's hard to tell. I yeah. mean it's it's not all clean cut and pretty and, and there's you know, people people do have a a limited attention span yes. for, and there's they're being inundated at all times right so much yeah everybody wants media. part of their time and part of their money yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so did you have a pretty good response on this tour did you feel like the audience enjoyed what you were doing and were into to what yeah. you're doing was it spotty was it yeah, you, know, I mean, you, always, it was... you hear horror stories of you know oh nobody <laughs> showed up or you know they booed me off the stage. But. I definitely didn't have any booing experiences. I'm grateful for that. <laughs> I did have a few gigs where, you know, it was minimal yeah. um, people showing up or a room full of people where they were talking over me, which, you know, right. happens in noisy bars um, and breweries and that kind of show. It's part of the yeah. job. And um, it's something that I'm trying to veer away from. Um, so I guess one result of that tour, and, and this is also just a result of a lot of the, the gigs that I've done over the past year, but over the past several years, <laughs> um, is just wanting to, to veer away from that type of show and really devote my efforts to booking, you know, shows in listening rooms or places where people yeah. are there for music and they, they want to interact right. with the music. I right. found for the shows that I put, you know, once I had the audience there and the people that wanted to interact, I had a really positive response. Cool. But it's a matter of getting people there in the first place and getting people who want to interact with music and they're not just there to you know drink and hang right, out with their buddies right and just want background noise yeah yeah, yeah. which is cool too like people can sure, do their thing it's just sure. as an artist i don't think though, my music lends itself to that right right yeah um tom the my co-producer and i saw you 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 were playing in one of those little listening room type mm -hmm. settings and you were performing primarily with an acoustic mm -hmm. setup mm -hmm. what changes do you make because i know you do play with a band occasionally mm -hmm. what changes do you have to make between your acoustic sets and your band sets, outside of the number of instruments, <laughs> um, you, you know how how does that change when you perform and, and where you perform? Yeah, so when I'm playing uh, in places where 
uh, I think it would lend itself to that venue to have the full band set up try to make that happen. And I've been working with the musicians that played on my EP, so cool. they were already familiar with some of the songs, yeah. and I've been teaching them some of the, the newer ones. Um, and a couple of those guys are also in my this funk band project that I was working on for the last year. Okay. And so we're already really familiar with each other's sort of sound, and right. um, it, you know are good collaborators, and so it's just kind of an easy um, flow and an easy okay. setup. But um, it's been magical for me just to get other instrumentation on my songs because I think I hear them a certain way and I, and to, to hear that fullness and that, um, I don't know, all of that power sort of realized and yeah. brought to fruition, just it feels really positive. To, to, I love sharing my music with other people cool. and getting other instrumentation involved. Um, and, and just giving it a backbeat beyond just my you know, one woman Right. Band shtick. So it's right. always it's always really I love playing with a full band. I think it brings a lot more energy to the songs. Sure. It makes sure. them just Do you write with a band in mind when you write, or do you just write and then it turns out the way it turns out? So I wrote just uh, you know, really with as a sort of my solo singer songwriter setup in mind for a long time. And so a lot of the songs that they've learned of mine I, were written really just for for me, and I had to tone back some of my embellishments and my. Oh, okay. I some, especially with the piano, sometimes I, I go a little crazy, <laughs> <laughs> and I because I'm just having fun with it, and I do a lot of, you know, there's a lot of soloing and a lot of just, right. little bits and pieces here and there, and so lately I've been trying as an sort of a an exercise trying to tone it back and write more with a band in mind, write a little bit toned back piano parts mm -hmm. um, that lend themselves more readily to, you know, other instrumentation filling in. Does it change space. Your, the structure when you write then? Are you more, um, rather than allowing yourself to kind of improv whenever you want and stuff, do you, do you tend to build it differently? Yeah, and I think that typically comes in the process of teaching it to a band because then it's like, okay. okay, well, let's solidify what is happening here. No, you know, who's soloing in this section or what, how is this going to go? Right. And I think lately in general and not, not with a band in mind, but maybe subconsciously to some <laughs> extent, um, I have been trying to limit myself to more, um, concrete song structures. Gotcha. Um, and part of that is timing wise, because sometimes I, I find a lot of my older, the older songs that I've written, I let myself run wild and they end up being a six minute song. Right. And Which can be words cool. Whereas Billy Joel, cut it down to <laughs> right. 305, gotta, <laughs> gotta bring it back. So I've been trying to limit myself a little bit yeah. with, the, with the song structure and make it a little bit more concrete. Gotcha.
it a couple times. Uh, you're working on a new project right mm -hmm. now. And we talked uh, about the difference in, in deciding whether it's an EP or an album. Yeah. <laughs> um, song length, number of songs, right. those kinds of things. And that can all be very tricky. Yeah. It depends what your audience is looking for. Um, but talk about your recording experiences and processes. Um, and, and there's a song that we had talked about uh, when we when we first met and we've kind of mentioned it off and on if you want to talk about your song sure. and how that kind of applies to that sure so recording in general so i've been recording uh with third and james studios in denver um and that, that's been a really positive experience we've had a lot of fun um it's ta you know it's been a long-winded experience and right. and i've um, but it's given the t songs time to develop and added suspense at least for me right. it's kind of the excitement <laughs> to get this out to the public and um yeah, and so it's been a cool experience. I've had some some really interesting experiences in the studio. Um, like there, so, one of the songs I had this vision of a lot of sort of unconventional percussion going into the song. Okay. I wrote it as sort of an a cappella song to be sung just with my suitcase drum and vocals, and um, and so then when we, when I took it into the studio. I, I mentioned this idea to the guys there and they jumped right on, they didn't judge it at all. They were like, all right, let's do it. And they jumped right on board cool. and we were picking up, you know, like salt shakers and a bottle of whiskey, <laughs> like flipping it over to make a noise from that. I was like brushing a lamp to get sort of a wispy bird-like sound from that. Yeah. And we were taking microphones into the alley to try to pick up street noise. And there's a, a sound Fun. of a, a lighter. You know, I, yeah. I can't believe they let me get so close to one of those beautiful right. microphones with a lighter. <laughs> But it's really, it was really fun, and um, I had one of the guys in the session say, you know, this is, I've never seen the, like, the producer guy there get, get so into it. This is awesome. Like, everyone's all jazzed. And so That's I've cool. had some really positive experiences with that process. Yeah. And then in terms of that one, that song that we were talking about, the first single off of the EP or the record. Right. It's a seven-song <laughs> EP. It's really sort of straddling that line. Right. I don't know what we can call it, but... The first single off of that is a tune of mine called Something Better. Uh, and I wrote that, I wrote it back in college, um, just after sort of a series of disheartening romantic experiences. Um, and I was feeling kind of frustrated and taken advantage of. And um, again, found that sort of catharsis and found my voice in a time where I was feeling sort of silenced um, by writing that tune. And um, it's just sort of a, it was just sort of an empowering song about demanding respect. Um, in those situations. And then I found sort of over time as I watched certain political events unfold, the rise in the Me Too movement, a lot of different things mm -hmm. that have been going on um, 
personal experiences that I've heard from my friends. Um, I sort of morphed the song into this this song of just sisterly solidarity and made it into sort of a an anthem of um, you know in general an ode to women and and the dis the res the respect that they deserve yeah. um, and needing to be heard and and believed in moments of honest vulnerability. Yeah. So it sort of changed the the I guess. It's still the same sort of baseline topic of the song. It's just sort of extended beyond myself and my own personal experiences. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. How did that, did that happen in the writing process or did that end up happening once you got to the studio and started doing the production on it? It wasn't in the studio. It was more with live performances. Okay. Um, and when I would go, I, I, was, I would play that song in my set and... I just sort of, I changed some of the lyrics, I changed some, you know, some the sort of feel of it a little bit, um, and it kind of came with my, you know, with my banter of just describing right. what the song was about and, and realizing that it was about more than me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So not necessarily in the studio. Does, but. does that happen with other songs? That as you perform them, they tend to change. Or once you get to the studio and start actually doing production, you're like, oh, you know, the song needs to go a different direction now because of, of the setting. Sometimes, yeah, it's, you know, it depends. I think I like to really find my songs through live performance. So I write them, and they feel like this this thing that's mine, and is you know, is this bottled or I guess not bottled up, but just very shielded personal. Um, expression of, right. of whatever I was going through when I wrote the song. Unless it's a story, I mean, I have songs that are about other stories and those don't really feel like mine to begin with. Right, Because I sure. feel like I'm just, you know, lyricizing someone else's experience. Yeah. But the ones that are really near and dear to my heart and about my own experiences, they feel like mine and then I start to play them live and they, they become less about me and, and more about that shared experience. And if I connect with someone in the audience and they say, hey, I really liked that song. It made me think of, you know, feel this way or think of this person. Yeah. I think yeah. that can can often change how I feel about the song and sure. what, it, what it starts to feel like it's about. Yeah. So I, I want to kind of go off track here for just a second and talk again about your acoustic setup. Sure. Because you have a unique setup. <laughs> um, and... I remember Tom and I looking at each other when you sat up and started to play and going, <laughs> What's that thing? <laughs> this is interesting. This is very different. So you, you're, you've got a keyboard on, on the stage. You've mm -hmm. got your guitar. But you also have a tailor-made suitcase drum. <laughs> Why don't you tell us kind of what that is, sure. um, how it fits into your performance, and how you came about making yours? Yeah. So I can't take too much credit. I had a lot of help from a friend. But um, so... I, for a long time, had been wanting, I've, I've got some experience playing with, you know, in some percussion. On, I played in a percussion ensemble in college, okay. and, um, I've, you know, I've done some stuff with percussion. And I really wanted to have an element in my live setup that allowed me to incorporate percussion without incorporating another human being. And I love Shaky Graves. Uh, I don't right. know if you've heard of him. But mm -hmm. He's a, a singer-songwriter. Um, I don't know if he would self-identify as a singer-songwriter. <laughs> An amazing musician, and he's uh, based in Texas, and he um, he plays with a, a similar-looking suitcase drum. So I okay. really just kind of stole the idea from him um, and wanted to develop one that had a similar feel, that I played the same way with my heels. Okay. Um, and so I went to my, my friend uh, who goes by Rooster. And nice. he's, uh, yeah, <laughs> a great musician. And he um, is a luthier in Fort Collins and owns a banjo shop called Cloverlick Banjo Shop. Nice. He's got all the power tools and yeah. the skill set to go with yes. him. And I, you know, and he had actually just helped another friend build a, a different type of suitcase drum that involved a bench. And so I started just collecting the materials I thought I needed, okay. and he helped me troubleshoot and figure out, you know, what else needed to go into it. And then with his help, we just, you know, started putting it together, and it's been really fun to play with and have as an additional element. Well, and it definitely does add to the show um, in, in a lot of different ways, the way it looks. Um, and, and then you, you have that percussion behind you and... You yeah, know. it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> is it, has it turned into a conversation piece? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Every, I, it's so funny. I love watching people in the crowd try to figure it out because right. I, I typically, I ha, I've, you know, I've gotten from doing a lot of live performance, I, I have sort of my set structure of the way that, I, you know, yeah. 
the time length varies depending on the sure. set length, but I start off on the piano and my suitcase drum is just sitting in front of the piano and I see people eyeing it and wondering, they're like, <laughs> why is it backwards? What's she yeah. gonna do with that? And then I go and play the guitar after and incorporate it and they, you know, they see their eyes light up with, yeah. all right, that's what that's for. And <laughs> right. sometimes people wanna play it and try oh, it really? out and it's, it's kind of funny. Yeah, that's cool. so it's, it's definitely a bit that's of a, a It's a cool connection, <laughs> connection you can make with people though. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah, for sure. So, how do people find you, um, either for booking or your shows or to buy your music? Sure. So you can find, you know, sort of the culmination of all of those things on ZoeBermanMusic.com. Cool. Um, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram, just under Zoe Berman Music and Spotify, I, Apple Music, all of those things. Cool. Just and you already have some music out. We've got this CD sitting <laughs> yes. here. Is yes. this the only one you've done up to this point? It's the only one that's released, yes. Okay. So I've got a couple of songs on Spotify and okay. Apple Music. Cool. All so that. people can and check then... you out before your new EP yes. drops. Yes. Cool. And then there will be a lot more there yeah. very soon. Awesome. Oh, and then booking. That was the other thing you asked about yeah. booking. Email. I mean, yeah, you can do that through my website or okay. just Zoe Berman Music at gmail.com. Cool. Nice and simple. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming in today. Yeah, thank you this so much for having me. You have cool music stories and your, <laughs> your setup is fun to watch. Thank you. Appreciate so, that. Yeah. Yeah, such a pleasure. Folks, stick around. We're going to be playing some of our music at the uh, end of the show, during the credits. We'll have all of our contact information up. Make sure that you check our music out. Make sure you like, you share, you subscribe. Show your support for these local artists. I'm Michael Hartsock. Thanks for watching. Future Artist Records presents. Depending on my current mood I don't like cheese or tequila Or the cold side of the pillow I can be hard, I can be soft I'm both a shark, I'm a minnow I might let you in But then I might just spit you right out I'll follow every sweet smile With a soul piercing power Text.
no way to know what's up next I'll keep you at the edge of your seat I'm burning cold and freezing in heat Hey.